Okay, I thought that I would take the time to do a little bit of an interface uh -huh, video, understood. just to explain some of the UI elements and how they work, um, and a few tips and tricks for uh, Pillars of Eternity 2. So, first thing I'm going to do is lower the volume of my sound, because I think I have it pretty high. Uh, so let me go into sound, and let's just jack this down to like 30%. Okay. Alright, now, uh, let's go to here. First of all, there's a there's quite a few more options and uh, tweaks you can make in the sequel. Um, font ligatures is in the both games. And I meant to mention this before, but I like them, and I don't know why it was off just now, so that's annoying. Um, okay, so I don't like Gibbs. Um, I don't remember if there's anything else here that I really have a big opinion on. Uh, loot area, I don't know why you'd want this uh, less than maximum. It's just like having to click fewer times. Auto pause, we talked about this. You'll be playing in turn base, so this for sure, and maybe a few other things I'm going to show you won't necessarily mean much, but um, and then here's a couple things here. You want to make sure you turn this off if you if it's not off by default, because it's very annoying to have your characters level up for you when it's half the fun of the game. Um, and then... Let's see. Oh yeah, I, this is actually kind of nice to turn on because you can. It, it just shows the scope of how big the conversations are, which is really impressive. But it's also kind of a lot of noise that you don't need. Uh, so that's a personal preference, I guess. Um, I'm gonna turn this on because I kind of like this. Uh, okay, so let's take a look here um, at anything else that I might want to talk about. I mean, you can have all this stuff turned on or off. That's up to you. Ooh, that's handy. And turn that on. Okay, so let's go to... I don't need 110 frames per second. Uh, okay, and then controls and camera. Uh, uh, the smart camera. Let's talk about that first. Okay, the smart camera is cool. It's a brand new feature. If you have smart camera on, when you click, the camera automatically follows your guys. And it's a little disorienting at first, and I used to play that turned off, but I have come to really like it. You can still use W, A, S, and D to move your camera around and, and break out of the smart camera, but it's nice when you're just like sitting, leaning back, and you're just just clicking on stuff. You don't have to like move around. Uh, it's very nice. I like it a lot. Okay. You can actually change the layout if you want to change how things look. Um, you can have things like your ability bar can be always available. So like my ability bars, are all this stuff is, a, is visible all the time because it's set, everything is set to always. I like... UIs in my games, so I like to have them on all the time. But if you wanted to, you could be like, uh, let's have, um, you know, only when you're paused uh, will you see the combat log, um, or out of combat, you'll never see the combat log. You know what? I probably should have uh, hit apply on that, huh? Oh no, I did. Okay. No, I did it backwards. There we go. Out of combat, never show. Out of combat, Never show, just to show this off. Um, combat, action bar, never show this. Out of combat, we don't need any of this stuff right now, because we're not in combat. And then when I get in combat, it'll pop up. Okay, again, I kind of like that stuff, but that's a cool thing I thought I would show off, in case you didn't uh, don't notice it when you start playing. All right, and then there's achievements. Now, here's something that's kind of cool, and you might wonder, while you're playing, when you get achievements, you get these little points. What are they for? Well, it's actually kind of fun. When you start a new game, um, you can spend these points to get cool bonuses for the next for the for that next game. And uh, this is the kind of game I've played through several times, and I keep seeing new things. It's a, it's a giant game, tons of content here. So when you go through all this stuff and you get all these points, and there's actually a few points I haven't even earned yet. Um, you can spend these on fun fun things like start with a bunch of money, start at a higher level, start with better equipment, start with higher stats, things like that. It's really cool. Uh, it's a fun way to start uh, to replay the game again. Um, oh, and like you can give uh, a deer a pet slot, for example. So let's talk about pets. All right, so the equipment menu does not look vastly different than you're probably used to. Um, however, there's a pet slot, and I don't remember if that was in the first game or not. You can see... Uh, there's my little kitty cat, uh, and pets are cool because they get, they grant you a bonus, in this case perception, and they grant a party-wide effect, which affects everybody, which in this case is anytime someone gets hit with a critical hit, 
it's converted down to a hit. So that's uh, kind of a nice little thing. I just, I found him very recently. He's very cool. Um, I started with this cool space pig, who is cool because he makes recovery penalty for armor a little bit nicer. What is recovery penalty from armor? Oh, by the way, a deer can unlock a pet slot if you pay at the start of the, uh, the start of a new campaign. I didn't this time, and I regret it uh, immensely because I really like having uh, a second pet slot. And a deer loves animals, so it's kind of a fun thematic thing. Okay, so uh, recovery is uh, a real-time thing, so that might not matter. But I'm going to show off a couple things on the mechanics of the game here. So recovery time, 3.8, that is... Normally it takes four seconds to recover from attacking. It takes half a second to swing the sword, and then four seconds before I can do any other action after that. It's reduced a little bit because of my high dexterity, but 3.8. If I had this pig equipped, now it's 3.3. .3. So it's a little bit faster. It's actually a decent amount faster. It's actually higher, again, because uh, my armor is a medium armor. Um, if I were to put on... Oh, it was my armor. It's uh, medium armor, so plus 35% recovery time. Um, if I were to have very heavy armor, which I, th I thought I did, brigantine, brigantine, there it is, heavy armor, plus 55%. So if I put brigantine on, which is great armor, I like it a lot, looks cool. Uh, now I'm at 3.8, and if I take this pig off, it's even higher, 4.6. So again, Heavy armor makes you attack slower. I don't know how it works in uh, turn-based mode, actually, but anyway. Okay, so let's look at the interface real quick, because it's a little bit different. First of all, you've got uh, this combat speed slider is very cool, but it's only for real time. But if you set it to something like really slow molasses speed, or just like slower, or normal, or faster, this is the speed combat moves at. Um, I actually leave it like right here in the middle between normal and molasses level, normally. Um, but, um, uh, get on there, okay. Uh, and then this is uh, non-combat fast movement, and then pause. Uh, but, here's the thing. Um, you've got AI behavior here. You've got crafting. I can make 51 things because of the materials in my inventory. Crafting is very simple and super, super useful. Um, so you look at potions, Potions, sorry, poisons, um, healing potions. I can I can actually craft a couple or one potion of uh, moderate healing, which is actually good to know. I didn't realize I could. I got some offensive potions. Potions are awesome. Source scrolls, and uh, this stuff is great. So it's really simple. You don't have to like learn these recipes. You just start knowing how to do all this stuff. Now the user interface for the characters is a little different than the first game because you've got a couple of new things. First. This game has multi-classing, so I'm a cypher and a monk, which is called a transcendent. What that means for my character's UI is I have cypher spells and a monk ability tab. Um, a deer, yeah. who I chose to be a swashbuckler, which is a rogue and a fighter, has rogue and um, fighter abilities. My Captain. cypher over here, Seraphin, he's just a straight cypher. And so he only has spells to pick from. Same with the deer. I, I, I didn't multi-class him. I, I didn't multi-class my priest. So just spells. Um, yes. every, th every character class in the game has some kind of resource that they can spend per combat encounter. My monk has two. Um, Cypher uh, uses focus, which he generates by... Um, he starts with 20, 22. And then he can go up to 80. He generates it by attacking. Monks gain wounds and mortification. They start with mortification and spend it and then um, they earn wounds by getting hurt and then spend it. So he actually, the, this particular uh, class combination is fun because I'm earning, I'm earning resources by both attacking and being attacked. So you always got something to do. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing here is this empower. And you can mouse over anything of course to get a look at it, but and power is really fun because you get, I think you start with three, and I think as you level up, you can earn more. Oh, Maybe you start with two. Um, okay. If you click on empower, and your mouse cursor becomes all cool, you can click on yourself, and it gives you more of all of your abilities, like one more use of all of your abilities for that combat. And then this is this is consumed until the next time you um, camp, basically. So that's not a per-combat thing. If you... 
Empower and then pick a specific ability like Blinding Strike, you are now using that ability at a higher, quote, power level. Power level is a concept that didn't exist in the first game. It basically means that your skills and your spells scale with how powerful your characters become. It's a really fun thing. Oh. If you cast a spell, um, the minor missiles here, for example, it's a first level spell and it does 5 to 8 uh, crush damage and corrode damage uh, with penetration of 8 and there's 5 projectiles. He has 5 projectiles because there's 3 normally and he gets plus 2 more because of his wizard's level. Like Because I'm a level 7 wizard, his power level is a little higher. If he were to empower this spell and cast it, it will actually I don't I don't I couldn't I can't look at it anyway, I don't think. But it'll actually cast it at an even higher power level, giving him maybe a six projectile, and maybe the damage becomes six to nine. So um, increasing anything that can increase a power yeah. level is good, because it basically is a more powerful effect. Uh, so it's nice that you can kind of built in just like go, all right, I really want to hit this guy really hard, so I'm going to do like a, an empowered um, soul annihilation or whatever. So that's how that works. Yes. Uh, let's see. And then, and then every weapon in the game, yes. if you're proficient with it, the only difference between proficiency and not proficiency is simply not having access to the special ability that these weapons have. So my monks yes. can use any weapon he wants. He can pick up a cool, find a cool saber, he can use it. No big deal, no penalty. But because he's proficient with... I don't remember for sure off the top of my head what it is. Okay. S-Stocks, Greatswords, Poloxes, and Unarmed. He gains access to these special abilities that every S-Stock has. Every Greatsword ha has this. Every Haymaker, or every uh, Polax has this. Um, so that's kind of neat. So he has a he has a really cool S-Stock right now. So let's talk about enchanting weapons, speaking of equipment. So any yellow item, not all of them, but but any like weapon and armor, basically. Like This is a yellow ring, but it doesn't have the enchant button. But they all have enchant on them. And this is the interface that will allow you to click Enchant and take a sword from Superb up to Legendary, or even up to, mm, and they have 60%, plus 50 in accuracy, plus 4 penetration, or up to Mythic, boom, um, if you have the right materials. So, and then this gives you, all, when you're in the enchantment screen, you get like a look at all the different uh, pieces of equipment you can enchant. Um, I recently picked up this Call's Stance, um, which allowed me to have this uh, called stance, which means once per encounter, I get a random buff. Um, learning, by the way, how to read uh, abilities and spells can be a little confusing at first, so let's take a look at that real quick. So, let's take a look at a spell, Puppet Master. It's a third level cypher spell, it costs 30 focus. Its keywords are deception and mind. What does that mean? Uh, probably nothing, but sometimes things refer to keywords. For example, if you had a perk that said all of your um, uh, fire oh. spells, for example, uh, are cast have plus one penetration, then the keyword fire appearing in fireball means that it qualifies for that uh, perk to get plus one to penetration. So then uh, we look at a spell like this. It's got keywords. It's got counters. Casting time, so that's the that once your recovery time expires, you're allowed to do the next action. Again, this is for real time, so uh, in turn base it doesn't matter. You can only do one thing per turn. But if you're curious, uh, you basically cast the spell. Your guy stands there chanting for 2.5 seconds, and then the spell goes off. Boom. And then after the spell goes off, you have to wait three more seconds before the next action can happen. Whatever that is, it's either. If you didn't specify an action, it's whatever the AI script's going to do. If it's maybe just said to auto-attack, he's just going to attack after three seconds. Or if you queued up another spell, then he'll do that spell. You know, uh, Range of eight meters, area of effect of three and a half. This, by the way, uh, is anything that is blue and has a, a mouse over on it can be modified um, or is being modified. So interrupts on crits uh, is just highlighting so you can see what a crit is. Um, penetration, 8.5. It's a little higher because of his power level. By the way, penetration is similar to how it was in the first game, but effectively, all you want to do is have your penetration number, 8.5, be higher than their, than their, um, 
armor rating to do the full damage. That's pre it's very simple, very straightforward. My character with his medium armor has a pen has a armor value of let's take a look. Um, armor value is nine, nine, uh, not too bad. Uh, and it's but it's only seven against crush damage and it's only seven against freeze damage. Uh, now, thankfully, that means if you were to fireball this character, he would actually take a little less damage from a fireball um, as cast by Aloth, 8.5 penetration, meaning he would take 25% per point under the target's armor uh, less damage. Just a little bit less damage. So that's how penetration versus armor works. Higher armor, less likely to take full damage. Um, low armor, probably going to take extra damage from being, uh, you know, um, dub if you double the penetration value, or double, uh, yeah, if you double penetration value, you're going to do 30% more damage. Um, that's pretty good. So that's how that works, and then you got um, effects. This is an AoE. It does 43 to 56 damage. Now, when it says AoE, by the way, that means it's going to hurt people, even your friends. If it said faux AoE, it would only affect foes. So mm -hmm. let's take a look at a spell that only affects foes. That's a hazard AoE. I don't know what that means. I'm not sure what hazard means. I'm sure it means something. Uh, that's an AoE, so it'll, it's got friendly fire. That's a uh, foe AoE. It, the target is going to take a bunch of damage, and then around the target, it's going to interrupt people. I'll explain interrupt next. Uh, but it also only it's only going to interrupt foes. So you're safe to drop a pillar, pillar of faith amongst your own friends. And you can always tell when something's going to affect Happy someone to because Why? it's going to highlight their base. See, I got the... See, the base is not, not highlighted, and now it's got the little, uh, I don't know, X pattern in the middle of it. Now, something that's kind of cool that you might not know is you see how whenever you have an area of effect, there's two shades. There's a darker red center and then the, like a lighter yellow outer edge. If I move this out, notice how I can still drop this fireball and it won't hurt my... It won't... It's no longer indicating it's going to hurt my guy. Here it does. Here it doesn't. That's because the extra yellow shading is the bonus area of effect size... Um, which normally the area of effect is three and a half uh, radius. Two and a half is the base. Inside the base 2.5 meter radius, it's going to hit anything, even friends. It's an extra meter in radius wider because of my intellect, because of a ring I've got on, and because of some magical armor I'm wearing. The bonus area of effect is actually not going to hurt my characters. So having bonus area effect is good for a bunch of reasons, but also it doesn't hurt you. It'll never hurt you to make your spells hit a bigger area. Um, and then, let's see, what else was I going to talk about last time? And I mentioned it, and I, I can't remember what it was now. I feel real bad about that, because I, I, I promised I would talk about it next. And it was... Um, hmm. Mm hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. What spells are I looking at? Maybe that will help. Was it this? Oh, interrupt. Okay, so there's two concepts that compete for um, there's there's interrupts and there's concentrations. Some effects and abilities hit so hard that they can cause what's called an interrupt. And an interrupt literally does what it says. It will if you are if you are for example in the middle of casting Pillars of Faith, 3.9 seconds, pretty long ca uh, cast time. It's one of the drawbacks of Pillar of Faith. Powerful spell takes almost four fucking seconds to cast. In turn-based mode, that does mean something. Because it means that when you initiate the Pillar of Faith spell, it's not going to happen right then and there. A couple turns later, it will drop. If in the meantime you get attacked by something that can interrupt you, real-time or turn-based, the interrupt will actually, if you fail the saving throw, which in this particular case is against your fortitude save, or against the fortitude of the enemy that you're trying to interrupt, it will stop the action completely. Boom. And action not going to happen now. How do you stop that from happening? If you have a concentration buff, which can stack, you can have two or three concentration buffs at a time, each time you get interrupted, if you have a concentration, rather than becoming interrupted, you just lose a concentration. And there's actually a really cool yes. perk 
I don't always take it for all my guys, but I, mean, I think I for Aloth, Aloth I did. Um, where you can sure. start the combat and get a free concentration buff stack. Just sort of like on your character. And it lasts until the fight's over or until you use it, stopping someone from interrupting you. It can be really nice to have at least one way to get a, con a concentration stack. And I'm pretty sure... When you go into the character sheet, by the way, you can get a look at all the current effects and abilities that are on, guys. Um, somewhere on here, it says that I get concentrate. Here we go. Um, my Cypher Shred abilities cost less. I get concentration when I Soul Blade. Um, I have extra focus, and I get... Uh, my okay, so my Soul Blade ability for my character being a Soul Blade is giving me uh, downing an enemy with a melee weapon temporarily grants concentration and raises max focus. So every time I every time I kill something, I gain a, a, a temporary concentration stack, which is really nice. So that's how, that's how concentration works. Um, the only other thing is buffs, which is kind of cool. Every attribute has three levels of buff and three levels of malice. Um, I don't remember what they're called, but like the first level will give you plus five in the thing. Uh, as an example, actually, um, let's see. I think someone, I, someone I, I know has uh, has one I can I can show off. Here we go. So um, robust gives plus five concentration, plus two armor rating, and plus ten health restored per three seconds. That's the tier three concentration buff. The tier one is just like plus five constitution. The tier two is like plus five constitution and like maybe an extra armor rating. And then the tier three is a big giant uh, bonus to armor rating and health restored, like a re like a regeneration. The malice will then therefore be minus constitution and I think maybe minus armor rating. And then maybe you I don't know lose health every turn. I can't remember how it works. Um, that's bad, obviously. So how it works is if you ever get resistance. Uh, to like, for example, constitution debuffs, then if you were going to get hit by the tier 2 debuff, whatever it's called, you instead get the tier 1 debuff. If you would get hit by the tier 1, you actually are unaffected completely. So, it's a very simple system, but it's really fun because there's a lot of different, like, um, you know, ways to use it. A lot of different buffs. Yeah. Like, I think this is one of my favorite buffs for uh, fighters to have. Discipline strikes. It's instantly cast, so you can just like cast it right when the fight starts. It doesn't even take an action, and it gives you intuitive, which is plus five perception, and it converts half of the grazes into hits, and then a quarter of your hits can be converted to crits. By the way, the the combat system for like hits and grazes is very very simple. You roll a hundred sided die, you add your modifiers, you subtract your targets like whatever defense it is if you're attacking them. With a sword, then you're attacking their defense. If you're attacking them with a lightning bolt spell, you're probably attacking their reflex. If you're attacking them with like a puppet master domination effect, probably attacking their will. Anyway, whatever your bonuses are, you would uh, add them to the dice roll, and then you subtract their will or whatever the target is. And then if it's over, um, I forget what the, I think 50 is what you need to do everything in the game, whatever it is, you succeed. If it's under that, you miss. Um, if it's over a hundred, you crit. Uh, you know that's how that works. So uh, I guess this is an easy example. Show me. If I were to yes. have Aloth cast uh, Necrotic Lance, it does a bunch of crow damage and then a bunch of crow damage every three seconds for seven seconds, and it uses accuracy of forty-three. Which, by the way, he's getting that from being a wizard, having a a, a decent perception. And his from his level. So 43 accuracy versus 42. So if uh, Aloth were to be firing a Necrotic Lance at something, you'd want to make sure you're firing it at something with low fortitude. So it's less likely to, you know, shrug it off. Um, I wish I was in a How fight. And, uh, but when oh you're boy. in a fight and you target stuff, I'm here. it gives you like a little in indicator over the target's head of your percent chance of hitting or whatever based on those numbers. So... Um, okay, well, I've been rambling for like 25 minutes. That's plenty. I, that's a good start, I guess. I'll get you going. I just I really glad. like the systems in this game and the interface. Here's your backpack items, by the way. Here's your weapon sets if you want to talk with two different yes. weapon sets. Um, you can talk to your NPCs. Um, second wind is an ability you get by putting points into 
uh, athletics, athletics, I think. So he's got like a one. He's got like a two. Yeah, athletics gives you second wind, and the more second wind you have, um, or the more athletics you have, the more this heals you. It's actually kind of a cool ability. Everybody should have a few points in second wind just to, just to have a free healing thing. Um, okay, well, uh, that's good for now. I think that's, um, I think that covers a lot of ground. There's also a great look at this combat log here, which you can, like, filter your characters with and see individual, like, things that you've done. Um, there's, let's see, stealth. Some of the stuff isn't the same as the first game. You can wait. Um, you can go to formation. And you can pick some of the defaults, which would be silly, because you can right-click on these cool custom ones and m move things where you want them to. Um, I like having my guy set up a little bit like this. Uh, you know what? Why is she back there? This guy changed on me. I still have her back a little bit, I think. Okay. Show me. Nice and How's quiet. That? Okay. Um, and then there is, uh, like, stop. Like, if you're in the oh, middle yeah. of moving, you can hit stop and it'll stop walking. Um, force attack. Um, hold on tab, uh, M for map, I don't know, I, I feel like I've covered a lot of ground, so I'm gonna call it good there, and if there's any questions you have, I'd be happy to answer them, uh, and in the meantime, if you're just getting into the game, uh, like the person I'm recording this video for, um, but I'm gonna put this for public for anybody who's, I guess, curious about, uh, Pillars of Eternity 2. Uh, I still love it. It's one of my favorite RPGs of all time. I can't understand how it didn't sell as well as it should have. It's gorgeous. It's fun. It's got real-time, satisfying real-time combat that I love. It's got amazingly fun turn-based combat that I also love but don't have the patience for um, anymore, I guess. As I, got, as I get older, I guess, I just don't want my turn-based combat to take like an hour and a half. Um, but I love it, and I wish more people played it. So play it. All right. Thanks for watching.